The Lord be with you. God's grace and his mercy and his peace are yours in Jesus Christ, our Savior. So a couple months ago, I was shopping for some new shirts for work and for church and with logoed stuff, and I spotted a fabulous, bright Kelly green shirt. I said I must have it for St. Patrick's Day. So I wore it today. So don't worry, I don't have a clear one of these penguin shirts, you know, that, um, that I wear it like that. But today at school, I was able to do it and avoided pinches all day long. It was very lovely. Uh, but St. Patrick's Day, and Aaron made a post on our Facebook page that you can check out, so I should always read it ahead of time so I don't say something wrong here now. Um, But we've got a few slides for you on St. Patrick's Day. I wanted to, uh, many of you know much of this tradition, but St. Patrick, you know, kind of the patron saint of the Emerald Isle of Ireland. And uh, those are very traditional renderings of him at different stages in his life. He dies around 460, so his life starts right around the turn of the century or so, um, and, and, um, and his life begins uh, diff- in a difficult way. He's a teenager, and he is um, captured by Irish raiders. He's from Britain. He's captured by Irish raiders and made a slave on, in Ireland. He's wa- he watches flocks and sheep and has a variety of menial tasks. But for years, I think it's six years, he's a slave uh, in Ireland, ultimately uh, uh, escapes, makes his way back to England, has this uh, strong conversion, sense of calling. It takes him 15 years to become a priest. And then, um, and then interestingly enough, is, feels this call, this deep, deep sense of call to go back to Ireland. That's quite a thing, isn't it? Why would you ever go back to the people who stole you away from your home, forced you from your home, abused, you know, enslaved you, took away your freedom, why would you go back? That's interesting. He does go back, and the legends abound about him. You can go on to the next uh, slide. So much of what St. Patrick's Day is, uh, dis- is, is, Im- is uh, imagined, Ireland itself, that, you know, the green, it's such a rich, lush, green uh, country, and then, uh, or people think of it as parades and parties and heavy drinking, things like that. That's how they imagine St. Patrick's Day. Or leprechauns and the luck of the Irish. And uh, the other one is is one that is a place that I'm very familiar with, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. And um, it's just a glorious, beautiful, wonderful, worshipful, reverent place of worship in the heart of Manhattan. Um, And so people imagine St. Patrick's Day, a lot of these images kind of come up to them. Go ahead and go next. But the ones that surround... Patrick are him, like this one we know is really probably almost certainly false, but the legend is that he drove the serpents from, from Ireland, right? Drove the snakes. And I have to show you, did you, do you like that cartoon? St. Patrick's drives the snakes out of Ireland. I wonder if it was a three wood or a four wood. Um, anyway, let's go to the next one. I'm trying to be humorous here in Lent, so you can chuckle if it's okay. Like this one, St. Patrick regrets his decision to drive the snakes out of Ireland, right? It cracks me up. And then the last one. Oh, wait. I didn't get to read the last one. Oh, yeah. St. Patrick drives the snakes out. Hey, let me tell you about this new diet I'm on. <laughs> anyway, okay. So you can go to the next one. Um, but those are legendary. This is a very, very iconic uh, uh, portrait, uh, picture of St. Patrick. And, of course, he's holding up a, a shamrock. One of the things that, that he, and he, we only have two works that we really gives us information about him, Patrick's own hand. Uh, called Confessions. And so we have some information from himself, um, but some of the things that are significant is that he was quite a teacher of the faith. It really wasn't that there were no Christians in Ireland when he came back, but really through his work and ministry, the, 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 the island as a whole, the nation as a whole, overwhelmingly then adopted the Christian faith. And one of the things he was brilliant at doing was taking common common everyday elements from their lives and using them to teach great truths. Now, a theologian will tell you that using a shamrock to teach the Trinity is improper and incorrect. And yet, to watch people embrace the mystery of the Trinity through the simplest of things that they saw every day in their life is a gift. And it's a treasure that's given to teachers, not to theologians necessarily, but to teachers. And so we're grateful for his love of the people and his longing and his searching and longing to find ways to convey those eternal truths um, to the very pagan people 
who had enslaved him uh, just years before. So the shamrock is, that's the reason of the shamrock, not just because it's green, but because Patrick used it to teach. And he used, had many, many examples like this. And the last one here, if you go to the next one, is this uh, Celtic cross. You can see in the Celtic cross, that, uh, that cross that's uh, really iconic throughout Ireland, the center of it really has the image of a sun. And so Patrick was instrumental in using elements which God had created and which had beautiful biblical connections and ties, but then incorporating them also. Now, some purists would say, oh, he paganized Christianity. And what he was doing, in fact, was the opposite. He was bringing Christ to the pagan world. And so he used an image which allowed those people who had grown up with it to now associate the Son with Jesus Christ, rather than as, as a created God uh, to be worshipped or to be feared or to be afraid of. So that iconic Celtic cross. I find it interesting. I wanted you to just share a few of those things because here's how this psalm begins. The unique title to it is this, a prayer of an afflicted man when he is faint and pours out his lament before the Lord. No other psalm has, has a title like this. It's one of our penitential psalms. And certainly we see those examples from the text uh, hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry for, uh, for help come to you. Don't hide from me when I'm in distress. Turn your ear to me. When I call, answer quickly. My days vanish like smoke. My bones groan like, burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered. It goes on and on. It's a man who's in torment, in affliction, and in pain, in sorrow, in grief. If we're not paying attention to this, we should. I just, I did not realize the statistics were this stark, but uh, as of January of this year, the data for people who are suffering from dis, uh, depression and anxiety is 400% than it was pre-COVID, 400% increase. Among people aged 18 to 24, 600%. It is six times what it was pre-COVID. And so it's, it, in many, many ways, you know, we, we, we say this is kind of like, um, um, it's not like this, it's not like the black death, it's not like no one is eating, it's not like, but the impact of this on how it's come to people, and people are suffering in silence, because some people are ridiculing their distress. Why are you distressed? Some people think that, are mocking them for that reason, and other people are calling them lazy or foolish, and I don't care what the, what the concern is, people are hurting. And when people are hurting, they cry out in anxiety. So we can analyze it, we can give you 10 reasons why they shouldn't feel a certain way, or why they shouldn't be apathetic, or why they shouldn't be lonely, or why they shouldn't, it's irrelevant. People are hurting, and they cry out in distress, and God hears their call. Again, I love this season of Lent because it's reflective. This is the season in which we say, God, hear my cry as it comes to you, and God hears our cry. The psalmist's lament and cry for mercy has all kinds of descriptors. Affliction, distress, isolation, loss, unresolved grief. Think of the people who have lost loved ones and been unable to resolve that grief. The people who, have, who we talk about social distancing, and I have a friend who I, I tease her because she, she is a big fan of Zoom, and she says, no, we're not social distancing, we're physically distancing, and I, I keep telling her, Jenny, it's the same thing. When we are physically distanced, we are socially distant. It is not the same as being together and connecting, touching, Seeing a person's body, their response, it is hard to put nuance into an email. It's hard to be able to see Zoom when you're wondering if they're wearing pants or not. It's, it's difficult. It's not the same. And so when people do this, there are unresolved social issues. Relationships are dysfunctional. Physical needs are not being cared for. Abuse is on the rise, conflict, and people criticizing one another, and people crying out who go unheard. 
people's anger and bitterness, and then they have to grapple with conflicting and confusing reports, all claiming to be the science you must pay attention to. So what do you do? That's the issue, because that is, in fact, our circumstance. Lent reminds us of that, too. It's my circumstance. It's my condition. And it's what brought Jesus to the cross. So that's the situation. The real question is, now what? What do you do? This Saturday, I'm gonna sh- I, I have the privilege of sharing at uh, Delphina Colby's memorial service. And I'm going to use the text that's powerful to me on Mary and Martha, Lazarus and Jesus. Lazarus dies. Jesus delays four days. Martha says, when Jesus shows up, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know he'll give you whatever you ask. And she, Jesus says, your brother will rise again. She says, I know he will at the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus says those great words, I'm the resurrection. I'm the resurrection. He who believes in me will never die. And then he says this, do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. And so it's a fascinating passage because Mary and Martha could have gotten lost in their anger, their bitterness, their isolation, their loss and grief. They could have gotten lost in that. And they could have merely blamed Jesus because he was not there. And so that's the situation. Jesus wasn't there. They are in their grief. What now? Because what I see happening in our world right now is a lot of hand-wringing, blame, and finger-pointing. That's what I see a lot of. And that's not what we're called to do. We're called to do what the psalmist does. Honestly, he cries out. Honestly, the psalmist shares their grief, their misery, their plea for mercy. Honestly, God does it. I mean, they do it. And what I find so interesting here is this is, this is where the St. Patrick tie comes in. Because in his years of slavery, how many times did he cry out in his affliction, in his oppression, in his lack of freedom, in his hurt, in his anguish, in his longing for something different? How many times could his prayer have echoed the psalmist's prayer along with those who are, are, are hurting so greatly? The real joy and the miracle of St. Patrick's Day is not that it's green and it's lucky and we have parties and it's fun. The miracle of St. Patrick, what made him far more than just a mere trivia point in history, is that he came back. He came back. He came back to free those who had enslaved him. Now that's a real Lenten theme, isn't it? He came back to free those who had enslaved him. How do you respond to that? Well, at verse 12, it begins to change. In verse 12, the psalmist says, But you, O Lord, sit enthroned forever. It shifts. I've cried out, but I know this to be true. You're the one who is in authority. You are the one who is in charge. This is the point. In the moment of despair, in hand-wringing, in finger-pointing, in blame-casting, to confess with faith, someone other than me is in charge. Really in charge. A person isn't always in charge because they've been elected or hired or called. People, so I remember one of the kids in school said to me, are you the boss of this place? And it's hard to say to about an eight-year-old, you know, Jesus is the boss of this place. But that is the right answer. God is the boss of this place. And when pastors and CEOs and leaders forget that, We fail to see who's truly in charge. And the psalmist confesses it. Verse 13, he goes on and says, You will arise and have compassion on Zion. Someone, somewhere, other than us, is needing to show compassion. Because what we're showing in our era right now is very little of that. Someone needs to remind us and teach us once again what true compassion is. Unconditional love, listening, patience, graciousness, not condemnation. And it looks like a cross. And it looks like Jesus. And that's why we're on this journey of Lent. Verse 13 concludes, too. For it is time to show favor to her. The appointed time has come. And that's what you see up on the screen here. I love this idea. 
Nothing, I mean, I've heard this statement numerous times, reading a book right now by Tom Rayner on six lessons from the pandemic for churches. So I'm reading it. So far I haven't read anything we haven't already figured out. Which is encouraging in many ways. That's encouraging. But one of the things he said, which I've said to you before numerous times, God was never caught by surprise. The pandemic did not catch God by surprise. Caught us, not him. There's an appointed time for God. All those times are appointed. There are days in history that are not in any way random days or random chance. The world needed a Savior. Paul says it this way, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son, sent born under a woman, born under the law, to redeem those born under the law. The birth of Christ in appointed time. The cross of Christ in appointed time. The resurrection of Christ in appointed time. The time has come in Christ's sacrificial death, which we approach now just a few days away, and in so coming has now made any time and every time an appointed time when God can and will show his mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. Verse 16, For the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. The prophet Isaiah tells us something interesting. In the final of the four servant songs, he says this. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Jesus foreshadows this in John chapter 3, where he compares himself to just as Moses raised up the serpent in the staff in the desert. So the Son of Man will be lifted up. Isaiah is saying the same thing. He will be lifted up, but in his lifting up on a cross... He will be exalted. He will be glorified. The glory of God is in the exaltation of Jesus Christ on the cross, lifted high for all to look upon him and to be saved. And the rebuilding of Zion, which the psalmist talks about, the Lord will rebuild Zion, it begins, or I'm sorry, it began the building of Zion with the temple where animal sacrifices were made, inadequate offerings. And it was torn down and needed to be replaced. And that temple has been rebuilt one stone at a time, beginning with the stone that was rolled away on Easter morning to reveal and set free the living hope, which is Jesus Christ, the once for all sacrifice of God. And then verse 19. Let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. I love that in, the, in Jesus' high priestly prayer. Jesus has it in three sections. And the final section is where he says, I pray for those who have not yet come. He's praying for us, you and me. I pray for you that are sitting here tonight. I pray for all who confess my name here in the year 2021, at the close of a pandemic and the start of a new moment. Jesus speaks for us. Let this be written, the psalmist writes, for future generations, that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. It's written then, for then. It's written for now, for us, for you. A people and not yet created and those still yet to come. Yes, there's a cry of despair. It's a real lament. It's a plea for mercy. And it's real. But so is the answer. No more hand-wringing. No more despair. No more finger pointing or blame. No more answers where there are no answers, but hope in he who is our living hope. Once crucified and now alive. So as Patrick came back to free the enslaved who had enslaved him, so our Lord Jesus has, re- has returned to those enslaved to sin and despair. And he will not allow our cry for help to simply fall into silence. Instead, he has not only heard our cry, but acted in perfect submission to bring us the certainty of his love and his healing hand. In Christ Jesus. Amen.